When playing a first-person shooter, there's a good chance that you'll come across a handgun. They're always found earlier on in the game, and they're usually on the weaker side, a characteristic that probably stems from the fact that they're small. I mean, I don't know, are you really gonna notice a difference between this and this when it's shooting a few grams of lead against the back of your skull? We don't have hit points. But headcrabs do, tend to be exact, and the Half-Life series has its own handguns to deal with them. Seated in Gordon's capable hands, or hand, the 9mm semi-automatic pistol and the 9mm pistol are easily recognizable, even with those terrible names. We'll call them the Glock and USP from now on, because I don't have to worry about getting sued. Today, we're going to go through both of these weapons and look at their development history, effectiveness, place within the arsenal, and everything else. I want to save Alex's pistol from the newest entry for its own video because of how important it is to the entire game. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Half-Life's pistol is based on the Glock 17, designed by Glock and manufactured by Glock. Half-Life 2's pistol is modeled after the USP Match, designed by Ulysses S. Prescott and manufactured by United States Postage. I've always found it interesting that game companies can get away with copying the entire design of a gun, but they aren't allowed to use the names. Like what, can you not copyright how a gun looks? I mean, that's capitalism and war combined, the United States' favorite pastimes. Anyway, both of these weapons are the second Gordon is meant to encounter in their respective games, though they can be acquired early. The Glock by murdering a security guard, and the USP by stacking boxes to get to a Metro Cop at the end of Red Letter Day. Neither of these are really necessary, but hey, they're cool. What's cooler is that you can get the pistol in Half-Life 1 even earlier by catching a Vortigaunt on the cart in anomalous materials, bringing it to unforeseen consequences, luring a security guard into the room, and harassing him until his death. All this really lets you do is murder Eli. Let alone create. No! Gordon, you're alive. You can often find both of these guns sitting around on shelves, or laying at the feet of whatever low-level armed authority figure you've just bludgeoned to death, be they friend or foe. Now, starting with the Glock, I find that visually, it's one of the least appealing weapons in the series, this stubby little thing, though it somehow looks a lot better than Glocks you find in other games, probably because of this light, purplish hue going over the whole thing. The sound effects are just okay. I like them more than most, probably the nostalgia value, but they really aren't anything special. The fact that you can get one by killing a friend is just one small way the game rewards you for being a jackass. I know it's a basic thing, but in my limited experience, you really only find these sorts of choices in RPGs or whatever the Fallout series is trying to be. If you want to kill a friend in a modern shooter, you'd better wait for the part toward the second act of the cookie cutter storyline where they betray you and it gives you a button prompt or whatever. The Glock holds 17 bullets like the real thing, though there was a mistake that gave it 18 in the first release of the game, and I swear I've seen it crop up in various other versions over the years. There was another glitch back in the day that let you reload it full capacity without any cost. I kinda wish they didn't fix that, it was fun, now I've got to spam Q to keep my fingers occupied. Half-Life 2's pistol is a bit less interesting. On the look side, it's a more faithful recreation of an equally boring looking gun, which makes it slightly more bland than the Glock in Half-Life, but better looking than almost any other handgun in a first-person shooter. It's fairly strong, you can kill people fast with it if you need to, but it lacks accuracy. A lot of guns in Source games have this thing where the first bullet, or one bullet for burst fire weapons like the shotgun, will actually go where you point the cursor. Then, unless you wait long enough, the rest go wherever the hell they want. In Half-Life 2, this first shot isn't even really accurate, so at certain distances instances, you're probably just screwed. The time it takes for the USP to reset and fire another close to the middle shot is longer than the time between spamming the button or holding it down, so you actually have to slow yourself further for any amount of accuracy. And this is the game where the crowbar kills headcrabs in one hit and zombies don't appear- Fuck's sake. And this is the game where the crowbar kills headcrabs in one hit- Oh my god. And this is the game where the crowbar kills headcrabs in one hit, and zombies don't appear frequently until you get the gravity gun, so you just won't be using this for most of the game. It's a consequence of Half-Life 2 always introducing something new and then never really focusing on it for very long, which works in its favor a lot of the time, but also means that you have like four weapons that are useful in most situations. The thing is though, for that half a chapter where the pistol is relevant, they do a surprising amount with it. I bet you didn't even know that it can get stealth headshots. Not the most useful thing, but it's there. It's pretty effective against the Metro Cops for this chapter. While the accuracy is questionable, there's not a lot in the way of long-range combat, and you're encouraged to be on the run constantly. This means you'll often find situations where running up and just blowing these fuckers away is more effective than anything else, and it helps you feel frenzied and vulnerable. As much as I love the first Half-Life, it rarely makes you feel emotions through gameplay the way the sequel does. In many ways, the USP's unreliability enhances that feeling, but that really comes at the cost of its usefulness in the rest of the game. Outside of Root Canal, the only time I find myself using the USP is in sand traps, flipping over antlions and filling their 
undersides with lead. It's not even that bad. It does more damage per shot than the SMG, but man, that accuracy. There just isn't any advantage to use the pistol instead of a shotgun or machine gun, especially compared to the first game. In Half-Life 1, the main thing that makes the Glock useful later on in the game is its accuracy. It'll hit exactly where you shoot every time, so if you run out of ammo for the dedicated sniping weapons, it'll always have your back. And since it shares ammo with the MP5, you'll always have access to it. I find it's one of the most useful weapons against the alien controllers near the end of the game, which is mostly up to my unwillingness to use anything better on them, but you can't argue with results. Aside from physicists, the Glock is also used by security guards and assassins, and one is significantly better at it than the other. Freeman, right? I've got a message for you. Make sure you don't- oh! Man, imagine if these were just mixed in with regular enemies in large sections of the game, and they threw, like, more than five of them at you at once. Wouldn't that be such a pain? A miserable, terrible pain? Speaking of opposing force, you find the pistol sitting here, carefully laid next to this bench with two perfectly placed magazines beside it. Come on, Randy, there are guard zombies in the next fucking room. All you had to do was rotate it and add a blood trail. Um, hi. This is editing me. I would like to issue Randy Pitchford a formal apology for this blatant slander. As you can clearly see, the handgun and magazine are not arranged as inorganically as my narration would have you believe, and there is, in fact, a bloodstain. I offer my sincerest apologies for this error. I can't wait to read the reviews for the Borderlands movie. It's worthless anyway, the Desert Eagle you have is better in every way, and you've got a shotgun by this point. Meanwhile, Blue Shift's pistol, represented with a Beretta in the HD pack, which, by the way, does not use the same caliber of ammunition as the new M4, completely destroying my fragile sense of immersion. I would also be remiss if I didn't point out that Half-Life, Opposing Force, and the HD pack use different models for the shells, even though you barely see them, which means that Gearbox thought it necessary to redo this tiny model twice, and... Wait, what was I talking about? Oh, Blue Shift's pistol is one of its most important weapons, simply because you don't get anything else for a while. It's also one of the rare cases in these games where a weapon is bestowed upon you with confidence instead of found laying around around the body of a dead man. Here you go, Calhoun. In conclusion, if I had to sum up Half-Life's pistol in three words, they would be simple, effective, and reliable. Granted, the pistol in Half-Life 2 doesn't really need to be as good. After all, the game it's from is much more forgiving, and handguns offer much more than just offensive power. They can be used for utility. Again, let's start with Half-Life 1. There's an alt fire to shoot more quickly with less accuracy, and ammo is pretty scarce in the first few chapters, forcing you to make use of the crowbar or explore to find more of it. If you're not the exploring type and never take the time to look around, you can be stuck without another gun all the way up to We've Got Hostiles, and honestly, that's rougher than it sounds. It harkens back a little bit to the ammo scarcity in Wolfenstein 3D. Half-Life doesn't force you to press E on every single wall to have a chance for success, though, thank god. And if that wasn't enough for you... Semi-automatic handgun is so strong... It even works underwater! This is almost pointless, but it can be nice to deal with fish without wasting crossbow ammo. So yeah, the Glock is decently useful outside of normal circumstances, but the USP really takes the cake here. For example, the explosive barrels are designed around it. One shot does nothing to forgive any accidental shots, two sets it on fire to allow a timed explosion, and three blows the thing up right away. The game gives you plenty of opportunities to learn and practice the mechanic throughout the first map, and later areas weaponize them against you. They also got that physics interaction with some barnacle bowling. Valve must have realized how fun it is to use the gun like this, because it's taken even further in the episodes. I mean, half of the lowlife chapter is spent blowing up zombies, and episode 2's final battle makes players use the Magnusons. They figured out how to make the pistol AND Striders not suck. Only took them three years. And now, it's time for a... Going back to the assassins for a second, you'll notice that they use silence clocks, because of course they do, it's a 90s action game. There are unused models and animations for a suppressor on the player's pistol as well, thought to be dropped by the assassins before it was scrapped. This was later reused in Team Fortress Classic and a whole bunch of mods. The leaked alpha has a different model and sound effect, and later demonstrations showed it with 12 bullets per clip. Pretty basic stuff. It's almost as if figuring out how a pistol should work wasn't very hard. Aside from the fact that you don't pull the slide back after reloading, but you did in these demonstrations! And it took forever! 
Moving over to Half-Life 2, the USP remained pretty much the same throughout development, just like the Glock. Seriously, try to find a real difference here, I'll pin your comment or something. If anything, it's actually worse in release because it doesn't eject shells anymore, but NPCs do. Boy, I hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Absolutely shameful. But not as shameful as the fact that he's holding it with one hand! Man, and this thing won awards? What the fuck? Far more interesting than the USP itself is who was meant to use it, the Combine Assassins. Decked out in an elite helmet and Aperture Science longfall boots, these would have almost certainly been a retread of Half-Life's Black Ops, with the added bonus of clashing with the rough, harsh look of every other Combine design in the game. It shouldn't be a huge shock that this was a Ted Backman design. Oh, and don't get it confused with the Alien Assassin, an entirely separate creature also cut from Half-Life 2. The Combine Assassin did make a small return in Half-Life 2 Survivor, the Japan exclusive arcade port with a new role as the sniper. After Half-Life 2, a few other projects were going to feature the USP as well. Arcane's game set in Ravenholm either featured it or used it as a placeholder, with a new melee attack that would have played into a lot of the new systems and mechanics the game was going to introduce. Years later, Valve's Half-Life VR demo called Project Shooter had its own USP, with changing lights to indicate ammo and chunky new sound effects. If I'm being honest, Alex development stuff is way out of my wheelhouse, but it wouldn't shock me if the model used here was intended for Half-Life 3. Alex's gun was. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching. Please let me know what you thought of this video in the comments or on my Discord server linked below. I will see you up ahead.